Good morning to our wonderful audience and welcome back to Boutiques on Wednesdays. As always, it's really great to have you join our sessions uh, on the early Wednesday mornings. We have a few presenters this morning uh, covering SA fixed income and a worldwide flexible mandate. So we will cover pretty much all asset classes and discuss the positioning of those asset classes going forward and the views of the managers that will present. Uh, as per normal, we will take questions in the Q&A box and try to cover as much of those questions as we can after all the presentations. Uh, one of our presenters is having a bit of technical difficulties joining in, uh, but on the line with us at the moment is Stace Forster, Chief Investment Officer at ID Capital, to give a brief overview of the company. And he is joined by his colleague, Andre. Uh, for an update on the ID Capital BCI. Uh, we are trying to get Mel from Platinum Portfolios on the line as well. We'll see how that goes. If not, we'll continue with the session. Uh, but for now, thank you for joining Tais and Andre. Uh, really grateful for your time this morning. And we're looking forward to your presentations and you can start when you're ready, sir. Thank you, Eugene. I'm just gonna share my screen with everybody quickly. Just tell me if you can see that, Eugene. Absolutely perfect. Okay, great. So Eugene, thank you very much for the opportunity once again to present to, to the esteemed, uh, my esteemed colleagues, co-colleagues uh, in the financial services industry. I'm just going to, as Eugene said, give a brief overview of uh, our company. Um, so ID Capital, we are a member of the IFSP group of companies. We've got a few other sister companies as well that um, basically service individual clients, IFAs. Uh, we've also got trust and fiduciary services, and uh, we've also got some tax uh, component as well. Briefly, just our approach. Uh, we are a style agnostic uh, fund manager. Uh, which means that we are flexible. It allows us to adapt to various uh, market conditions and opportunities as they arise. And we blend elements of different investment styles, so, such as value, growth, and momentum. And uh, we actually adjust our portfolio allocations across all the market capitalizations. That's large cap, medium cap, and small caps and sectors. Um, so we believe that our approach actually offers uh, much more diversification. Um, it enables us to exploit opportunities in various market segments. And that obviously hopefully uh, leads to better risk adjusted performance. So when we look at shares, um, you can see there that we talk about quality. That basically means that we're looking at shares that's got strong financials, financials a competitive moat, uh, consistent earnings growth, uh, profitability, uh, low debt levels, and very important for us is um, the management uh, need to be efficient in the companies that we value. What we offer is a uh, four suite of funds, starting off with the ID Capital BCI Income Fund, which my colleague Andre Retief is the fund manager of, and he will um, take over from you just now to talk a little bit more about that, uh, that fund. We've got a regulation 28 balanced fund of funds. Uh, we've got the flagship, which is our worldwide flexible fund. And then we've also got the one that's a little bit on steroids, worldwide equity fund, which has got an 80% minimum uh, equity uh, allocation. Um, just to plot them on a, on a risk profile in terms of the, the expected returns versus the, the, the risk, um, as you can see there, the ID Capital um, Income Fund lowest risk. Um, it's more of a moderate uh, fund. The, the balance fund, definitely moderate. Uh, flexible, a little bit more aggressive. And then on the high end of the, of the slide is our equity fund. So that's that's basically me. I'm going to hand you over to, to, to Andre, and uh, he's going to take you further on uh, what's happening on the income fund. Thanks, Thais. Thanks, Eugene, and everyone for logging in today. Just full disclosure, this isn't um, a fixed income presentation, so um, please don't turn off. Um, we're not going to talk about load shedding or government first because it's going to be interesting. And we start off with, is it time to take the safer route? Meaning what's happening in the world at the moment with Credit Suisse and everything's going on. 
is it time to adjust your asset allocation in a more conservative matter? And we like to put up a comparable slide saying that there's many ways of getting to your destination. And that's the same for traveling from Cape Town to Joburg as it is for investing. And there's a lot of ways of traveling. There's air travel, there's by car, there's by motorcycle, and there's by taxi in South Africa. And we say that air, air travel is the safest mode of transportation with the least death in the market. And, and we see the same for fixed income in the next year. Uh, but as mentioned, not all modes of aviation are made equal. And we show you here just a few interesting slides that's saying, actually, it's the air balloon that has the least amount of fatalities in the, in, in the world um, compared to, obviously, airplanes, helicopters, all of those type of stuff. Why wouldn't you choose the safest option? That's what we're asking you. And we think that ID Capital is the air balloon in today's market where, where you actually should avoid credit risk going forward. And our view is how we protect and participate. Once again, credit risk, buyers aware, be aware. We don't forecast, we evaluate risk premiums. We see a lot of global opportunities and we're still better off than many other emerging markets. And yeah, obviously we always get the question, what do we do differently? And we're gonna, we're gonna illustrate this for you. We have a hypothetical income fund where we actually, um, we took the mark to market data dot of the JSE, we threw that uh, dots towards the highest yielding assets. And as you can see here, we've got a weighted average yield of 10.68 and a duration of 1.33. We have 10% allocation to each bond year. And if I show anyone this portfolio, they'd probably take a yield of 10.6% 10 10 with a duration of 1.33. But I mean, just to just full disclosure, we have some 50% is floating rate and 50% is fixed rate. But let's say for argument's sake, I show you the names on here. And I tell you that we didn't look at any credit ratings. We just threw darts at all the high yielding assets. And just once again, full disclosure, I mean, these some of these bonds are actually proper bonds and 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 bonds we would consider in other mandates but not our, not this current one that we are selling that's what different difference us we take a more conservative stand on exposure to credit risk and um we think this is probably the market to do so the preference we have at the moment is offshore credit looks attractive especially the short term of the curve and emerging market usd Locally, we prefer the belly of the curve, and the belly of the curve, we mean just the middle of the curve. And um, the curve is usually split up in the front end, the back end, and the middle. Uh, we prefer local short-term maturity credit. Um, we also say local 81 bonds look crowded. Um, you've heard a lot about that with Credit Suisse in, in, in the news lately. And we have a small position in short-term inflation league bonds. And then once again, I say no gold and no stocks. We've seen a lot of um, flexible income funds these last year with actual stocks such as Anheuser Bush and gold. And we don't believe that's the payoff profile we're looking for. And to start to put the, the presentation, where now? Offshore versus local. We dig a bit deeper into offshore. Just one slide on, on inflation and on interest rates. The Fed usually looks to increase the PCE inflation, which is just another way of looking at inflation above the Fed funds rate. Um, since we've pulled this data, they increased it about 25 bips. They're probably going to do another 25 bips or so. So we think they're more or less where they want to be at the moment, um, close to close to terminal rate probably in, in, in the short term. Me medium term, obviously, we do not know what's going to happen then. Just to show you where um, active management can play a big part in, in asset allocation, if you look at 6 March 2022, the blue line is, is what the market expected a year from now, uh, from 6 March. So that's actually what the market expected for 6 March 2023. And that's if you look at the blue line, that's 1.4% 1, 1 in a Fed's funds rate. That's, that's the repo that the market expected. Fast forward a year from 6 March 2022 to 6 March 2023, the Fed's fund rate is actually about 4.5%. So the market got it completely wrong and the market expect from a year from then again, the market expected the terminal rate about at 5.5. From 6 March, 2023, just fast forward about two weeks later, the market is actually saying, no, we were wrong two weeks ago. We are actually gonna cut rates by a full percentage. And, um, that's the irrationality we see in the markets, and we think that's where active management plays a big part. 
Moving on, we say the reprice, the repricing of the global markets has led to incredible offshore opportunities. On your left hand side, you can see this is the first time in 15 years that we actually got yields in the investment grade bonds offshore of about 5%. And then on your right hand side, you can see the bottom line was the yield curve, the US yield curve a year ago, and the top line is the US yield curve now. And you can see a year ago on a six month treasury, you got about 1%. Now you can get about 5%. So there's about a 4% delta in, 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 in returns that you can get there. So by way of example, um, we always like to show examples. You can take a subtle one-year maturity in USD dollar denominated. You can get about 7%. And if you swap out the currency, you can get, get about 2.5%, 2.6% um, for swapping out the currency. So that equals about 9.6% in ZAR for one-year maturity papers. So we compare that. We compare it against the one-year NCD, that was the Investec NCD. At point in time, it gave us about 8.75. And if you interpolate the government bond yield curve, because there wasn't a, a one-year, exact one-year government bond at that time, you get about 7% in ZAR. So you get about a 2.6% pickup versus the government bond curve if you buy the SAS or one-year USD and swap out the currency. And just last but not least, we just want to show you that there is some um, diversification benefits for buying offshore versus local. Yeah, at the bottom, I have the US high yield and the US investment grade bonds um, versus the all bond index locally. And you can see that lower the lower the figure is, the, the, the better it is in terms of diversification. You can see investment grade is about at a 0.2% um, and high yield is about at a 0.4%, telling us that there is some diversification benefits with offshore. And moving over to local, um, as you can see, we said local is probably better um, than many other emerging markets. And with that statement, we are saying that we don't have a lot of good competition at the moment in emerging markets. So they're making us look a lot better than we probably are at the moment. Um, you can see Russia's there, Pakistan is there at about a 20% repo rate, the currency blew out, Brazil at about a 13.75% repo, also not going well there. And then you have South Africa there, somewhere between Colombia and Turkey at, at our 10-year at our bond, bond rate. It's probably important for everyone owning some uh, owning houses at the moment. So the market says the repo rate one year from now is probably going to be flat at about the 7, 7.5% 7 um, that we're currently seeing. But that doesn't mean in the short term we're probably going to do a 25 basis points, maybe another 25 dependent on, on what inflation and growth does in the short term, but the market's expectation for now is one year from now will probably be flat. When we model that, um, we obviously say, like I've mentioned, we've got the front end, the middle end, of the, which is the belly and the back end of the curve. And we do think that that the, the middle end, the belly, is probably fairly valued at, um, and, and that's what we prefer at the moment. We do not think it's, we do not see excessive value like the rest of the market sees at the moment, but we do think there is a bit of duration, especially when interest rates um, um, increase a stop or just flattens out from here. And we get the question a lot as well, can I protect my capital with the government bond? And, and the answer is probably, so what we did here is a break even zero, break even some, meaning if you buy buy the, R, the 250 at the moment and you keep it for one year, you do a 0% return, your yield would move from the 10.5, would move to about 12.37%, which is the highest it's ever been. But as you can see on the right-hand side, we actually say when it comes to capital protection, we prefer NCDs at the moment. You can do a nice return about eight and a half, eight point eight point seven. You can do um, in, in rands, which is quite attractive for us, especially when you run a when you run a barbell portfolio where you get where you get the NCDs in the front end, and you end the back end of the curve, and you run a barbell portfolio. To get over the credit, I've mentioned that the the local eighty one bonds is crowded. You can see on your left hand side with the blue graph, you can see spreads has moved from about seven hundred basis points over to about three fifty. And, and when when you actively in the auction, like the, like us, myself and Tice, you can see that the, the, the bid cover ratio is, is extreme at the moment. And, and we do think when you model for these type of portfolios, investors are going to have a problem in, in the future for, for harnessing that extra alpha from these type of papers. And at the right-hand side, you can actually see that, that the probability of default for banks 
uh, and, and developed finance institutions are increasing, but you get the papers like the 81 papers actually trading at historical crazy spreads. Moving over to our asset allocation, we've increased our, our money market, our cash exposure. It's at about 16%, um, majority over 50% in floating rates assets, still harnessing that increase in repo, which is which has done well for us, and then about 50% in fixed rate bonds. This is just another uh, a breakdown of it, but you can see on your top right hand, as we've increased the money market, um, yeah, we think the NCDs are going to do quite well for us over the next year. Everyone's always asking about duration, so we do actively play duration. As mentioned earlier, we are a lot more conservative on the credit, so we would actually prefer to stay conservative on the credit and just increase our duration exposure. And by that meaning, if 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 it's a higher yielding portfolio you want, you would actually move, you would actually go to our the hypothetical portfolio that does about um, Jiba plus three plus four. And if you come to the ID Capital Income Fund, we're aiming for about Jiba plus one and a half to two. And we we're happy to say we we could have achieved we could have achieved that in the, over the last three, four years. Yeah, thank you for your time. Um, just want to say that our fact sheet is, is on our website. Um, we prefer that you invest in the B class. It's a lot cheaper when you look at the money, uh, money mate and, and the morning star figures. It's our A class on there. It's a lot more expensive. So from our side, we sell the B class and, and it's done quite well. We think just to summarize, we think credit risk is going to be real in the next year. We think you want to be in a low credit risk environment, rather take a bit more duration risk to honest that alpha. And yeah, be safe, be safe from credit risk and thank you for your time. No, thank you very much for that. I see uh, Mel was able to join us as well. Uh, good morning, Mel. I just wanna check, can you hear us fine? Um, yes, I can. Mel, thank you so much and uh, apologies for those hiccups with getting connected, but we're very glad to have you on our session as well. Uh, you're going to take us through your views on global markets and then more specifically your worldwide flexible fund, uh, how it is positioned and where you see those opportunities. Uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Are you going to share from your side, Mel? Yes, I will. Yeah, it's coming through. I can see it if you can just put it in full presentation mode. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Mel, we're ready for you if you are. Thank you very much, Eugene. Firstly, thank you very much uh, to BCI for giving us the opportunity to present on BCI on Wednesdays. And in my presentation, I'm going to give you a company update on Platinum Portfolios, our current market view, and some feedback on the Platinum BCI Worldwide Flexible Fund. The Platinum team at the beginning of the year was made up of myself, Sherilyn, and Barry Stenkamp. And since then, Stuart Green has joined us um, as an analyst on our multi-manager solutions. And we're delighted to have Stuart as part of our investment team. Just a reminder regarding Platinum Portfolios' process, we like to keep things simple and we only buy quality companies that have a durable competitive advantage. That is to say companies that have got a wide economic moat. We do all our own research and have a deep understanding of the companies we invest in. And in all instances, any business that we buy into must be a business that makes sense to us and it must be a business that we understand. Lastly, and most importantly, we cannot pay an inf infinite price for any business and that the price we pay has to fall within the ambit of our fair value calculations to give our clients a real return over time. So what do we believe is currently uppermost on investors' minds? Global inflation has shot up across, across all regions in the world, which has called, caused central banks to raise interest rates aggressively. Um, there is currently risk of a US recession over the next few months. We're gonna look at the South African investment environment, which we believe has got a lot tougher. And then obviously China's reopening at the beginning of the year provided good liquidity and we had a good run in commodity stocks, which has since fallen back slightly. So if we look at this graph, which is a graph of the US 
um, inflation rate and the different metrics, CPI and core inflation, going back to 1973, we can see that it's our view that inflation peaked in October of 22. And on all the metrics, headline, core, food, energy, that are measured in the States, we can see that inflation has come off, but it has remained stickier for longer, primarily driven by a very, very strong labor number in America, employment numbers are very, very low in the States. The inverted yield curve, which I mentioned, and this graph goes back to 1971, which gives you an indication of all time periods when the short dated bonds were higher, yielding higher yields than the longer dated bond, bonds or the 10 year treasury in the States. Going back to 1971, an inversion of the yield curve has always been a precursor to a recessionary environment in the States. So this to us is one of the signals that shows that the American economy is possibly gonna enter a recession, or be the fact that labor in, labor in America is very strong and the, the percentage of people unemployed in America is the lowest it's been in a very, very long time. So the jury is out to see what is going to happen to the American economy, but the inverted yield curve to us is a red flag. Looking at fundamentals, which is where we, we try and focus our, our research and determining what we buy or sell. If we look at the right-hand bar chart, we'll see those are analysts' annual earnings projections going back for quite a period of time to 1996. You can see in all instances but one, analysts were over-optimistic on earnings projections. So if we look on the left-hand side bar chart, the current analyst earnings estimates we believe are too high and that we, we believe that with earnings coming out in quarter one and quarter two, that the analysts will start adjusting their earnings estimates. Analysts currently are saying that the S&P is going to earn 240 Rand in 2023. We personally believe that's over optimistic. So if we look at the current stats on the S&P 500 index, we can see on all ratios, the simple forward PE ratio, the CAPE ratio, dividend yields, price to books, et cetera. On all ratios, the S&P 500 is not cheap. The market's not cheap, and we find it diff difficult to find any value in this current market. So let's get back to simple fundamentals. We look, like to look at a simple formula, which gives us the fundamentals, the earnings. Let's take the analyst forecast of 240, and let's take a PE multiple, which is neutral, which is the 60 year average on the S&P 500. That would give us a fair, fair value on the S&P 500 of 3785. However, it's our view that earnings are not going to be 240 for the year. And it's our view that the S&P is going to carve out earnings of about 210, 212. And that would mean that the S&P 500 would be fair value at 3500. But you will have to decide what levels you're comfortable with. We are currently not very comfortable with the level on the S&P 500. So based on current fundamentals and earnings projections, as I pointed out, we feel they're far too optimistic. As we all know, the Fed has raised rates aggressively over the last year from a low of virtually zero interest rates to where we are stuck now at about 5%. These rising interest rates have given given rise to the short banking crisis that we've had in America. And we've seen three banks already being getting into trouble. One of the banks, Signature Bank in the States, is the S&P 500 company. We've seen SVB Bank in trouble. We've seen Credit Suisse in trouble. And we believe that these, these are all caused by the rising interest rates. And in fact, if you go back to the UK economy a few months ago, they had a similar crisis because of the rising bond rates that have caused 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 bank balance sheets to become stretched. So we don't think that that's over. We think there are still more surprises to come because of this rising interest rate environment. Additional to that, we feel that the monetary policies and the financial markets take, the, the monetary policies take much longer to have an effect on the market. And the, and the monetary policy by the Fed has long and variable effects on the economy, and that takes quite a while. Although inflation has peaked, and this has encouraged markets because that market, market participants believe that we're entering a period of lower inflation and they've been focusing on growth stocks, 
we believe that there are inevitable lags that are going to present themselves in the market over the next few months. Recessions, in all recessions, we have an inverted yield curve. Prior to a recession, we will see bond yields decline, we'll see credit spreads widening, and risk assets will fall. And this recession has all, will also have a backdrop of a liquidity contraction, and we've seen some indications of that in the current market. So the reaction might be delayed, but we're paying close attention to the fundamentals. Summary and conclusion on markets today, on company results and company projections, we've seen a lot of cost cut 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 cutting by companies, specifically the tech companies, which we, we believe is primarily due to the fact that they see slower earnings growth going forward. We feel that companies are giving us warnings that in their earnings, that earnings are going to be under pressure. So we believe we'll see continued earnings revisions going forward over the next few months and that current valuations are expensive. On our view, on our fundamental view that earnings are going to come in at 212, we see a further 10 to 15% downside on the S&P 500. Currently within platinum portfolios, we thin some holdings and we have a lot of cash available to, to buy companies when they enter our fair value area. And just lastly, we focus on multinational companies. We believe they provide us with a very good geographical spread. Multinational companies can react to the environment in which they operate. They can allocate cash to areas in the business that are doing well. And they also provide our clients with a built-in currency hedge. When we look at the South African investment environment, as we are all aware, the South African environment has become particularly difficult and we have a framework that that we need to tick, tick certain boxes to invest in any economy. So currently the South African environment is very tough. We are finding opportunities in the South African market, but due to the political risks and due to the low growth in this economy, we've had to increase our margin of safety before buying into SA stocks. So we're watching that space very closely but currently we are still very wary of SA Inc, primarily because of the fact that there's no growth and consumer confidence is at all time lows. So to give you guys an update on the Platinum Worldwide Flexible Fund, this fund was started in November of 2005. So it's got a long track record. It has provided our clients with a return of 13.48% compound per annum over that period. So we are particularly proud of the performance track record of the fund. We are very happy with the fact that it's outperformed its benchmarks over all periods, and it's outperformed its peer group over all periods to, since inception. Having a look at the asset allocation of the fund, as I mentioned, we're sitting on a lot of cash. Our equity allocation is at about 69%, and we have a balanced exposure to global bonds, local bonds, and local enhanced yield. So we are well positioned to take advantage of any opportunities that might arise in the market. So if we look at what we have done in the portfolio of the last 12 months, our turnover was about 4.7%, which is ordinarily low, but typical of how we manage money because we like to buy business for the long term. So in June, June July of last year, when the market fell back, we were very excited to buy Ampanol, Qualcomm, Texas Instruments, and Nike. Now, Ampanol to us is a company that we've always wanted to own. It's a company that was started in about 1932. It's a company that focuses on the connectors in business, providing cables, connectors from the space program to the military applications, to computer applications, to any application that their clients require, Ampanol provides the connectors. So we are very excited that we were able to buy that business when it became cheap. It has provided clients with very good past, past performance. And we believe with the connector environment being so strong within cloud computing and computing and tech, that Ampanol will continue to do well. Qualcomm to us during that period became very cheap. We added it to the portfolio. It focuses primarily on the Android space in the cell phone business, which is the biggest part of cell phones across the world. It also has good tech in 3G, 4G, and 5G. And we think that this country has, this company has got a long road ahead of it in terms of returns. Texas Instruments is a business that we've wanted to own for the last four or five years. It became cheap for a very short period of time. 
It's the company that produced the first transistor in the 40s. It's a company that produces analog chips in many, many applications across the world. So it's got a wide moat. It's provided clients with great returns. It doesn't have a lot of debt. So we're very excited to have added that stock to the portfolio. Nike is a company that we've also wanted to own for a long time. It's the premier sports brand across the world. And what we particularly like about Nike is the fact that it's growing its online presence very strongly and that year-on-year -year growth of over 20% last year. We also topped up on Amerisource Bergen, which is a wholesale druggist in the States. We topped up on William Sonoma. And during the year, we sold out of Yum China. We sold Pfizer to take profit. And we sold Intel and 3M primarily because of concerns on the cash flow of those companies going forward. So that is my presentation, and I'll be available to answer any questions at the end of the presentations. Thank you very much. Mel, thank you so much for that. Very insightful indeed. Uh, I've got a couple of quick questions for both you and Hundro, but Mel, one I've got you in the line, I'm going to start with you. Uh, maybe just quickly, I'm trying to better understand uh, exactly how you treat the onshore, offshore argument in your fund. Because if you look at the worldwide flex category, I see your benchmark is inflation plus five. So it's not a compensate. Uh, but and if I look at your asset allocation numbers currently, and again, apologies if my numbers are stale, but offshore equity is sitting roughly at about 60. Uh, it might have been trimmed in the meanwhile since I've got the numbers. And SA equity roughly at about 8.7, it's called at 9%. You did say you are wary of SA Inc., but I mean, that's that's probably about 30% of the SA market. And you also mentioned that the MECI, or specifically the S&P 500, you know, it's expensive. So, and, you know, there's, there's a big cautionary out there from your side in terms of maybe another leg down. So how do you see the world at the moment when you look at asset allocation? Uh, what is that 60% offshore or what is that number at the moment? And are you looking to increase things like SA equity, but not necessarily in the SA ink space? Yeah, just looking at the number, the number hasn't changed since you've received your numbers, Eugene. Um, so in every instance, we like to own businesses and like companies that, that we believe on our projections are going to provide real returns in line with the benchmark. Um, so you know, if we look at SA, there are various companies. When I talk about SA Inc., I'm talking about SA companies, not companies that are exposed to offshore markets like our top eight or nine stocks. Yes. Um, and we will buy any of those stocks if they fall within the framework of what we believe um, meets all the benchmarks. So to us, that's important. We, we don't like to overpay for companies, and they must and they must meet our requirements before we invest in them. And importantly, they have to trade at fair value in terms of our research. So whether it's SA or offshore, um, it, that, it's, it's regard, we don't regard that as a requirement. But importantly, we do have a lot of enhanced yield in South Africa because there we get a real return without taking out of a lot of risk. I don't understand that. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, in terms of the dollar, we all know that the dollar... Uh, is very pricey at the moment, and the rand probably undervalued, but also under, other currencies, currencies undervalued relative to the dollar. But if you look at where the world is going, the whole issue around deglobalization uh, taking place, and maybe to some extent some de-dollarization, I know there's no such word, but let's use that for now. Uh, what do you think could happen to the US dollar you know, in the foreseeable future, are we going to, is it going to lose some steam? And do you, do you consider that, or is that a potential risk for a portfolio with predominantly global exposure? Well, let's just go and have a look at the dollar as a currency of last resort or reserve currency. I think over the last 20 years, the dollar has, the dollar deposits worldwide have declined by, from 70% to around 60%. So, and the dollar since I think 1948 has devalued by about eight times. So when it comes to the way we look at the world, the reason we buy multinationals is because that gives us a diversified exposure to all currencies around the world. And secondly, those companies are much better measures of product productive environments in which they work. So we would not like to hold any specific currencies 
even the dollar over a long period of time because that's a license to lose money over time yeah. because all currencies will become worthless over a longer period of time. So we prefer to buy good businesses um, that are geographically spread instead of focusing on one currency. So in the true sense, a true worldwide flexible portfolio and you'll shift as you see the opportunities arise. Uh, Andre, maybe just a question for from my side to you. Uh, and it speaks to where rates are going. We, we've seen the rate, uh, well, the Fed didn't pause yet, but they're obviously slowing the rate of uh, increases, especially given what's going on with SVB. It could be to create a little bit more financial stability. But could you see that the SARP actually starts to decouple uh, from developed markets, uh, the Fed and probably the ECB, where we could see potential rate cuts in SA sooner than developed markets. Well, Eugene, we know we're not economists here, but I mean, uh, let's look at it fairly easy. Is in 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 terms of core core inflation, we don't really have core inflation. We have we have a problem of headline inflation, which is driven by by global factors, not not the same factors that's driven in South Africa. So I'll give you an example. We don't have that type of um, wage inflation that that they see in the U.S. and and the shortage in labor markets. So, if you see the whole global inflation coming down and you see food inflation easing as well, it's supposed to be a leverage factor to South Africa. We're supposed to see the decrease be a lot quicker than the rest of the world, but we haven't seen it in the food inflation, which is quite a big problem for us. And obviously, the currency is a big a big problem for us. So, if you talk to Saab. The two biggest problem, the two biggest inputs they have in their models are probably oil and the currency. And um, oil has come down quite quite drastically, which is nice for us. But the currency is still there. So if the currency needs to bomb out, the Reserve Bank will probably have to act just to, to to get the currency stable. But yeah, all things equal. I mean, our core inflation is, in theory should be should get down a lot quicker than the rest of the world, and then then that should should get the the soft to pause in theory. But I mean, there's a lot of other variables that comes in there. A lot can still happen, and we've learned that over the past uh, year. You know, so never think you know because you just don't know. Um, maybe just again, you know, on uh, securities that you hold, what is your views uh, twofold? First of all, on local ILBs, and then global ILBs, and would you include that in your portfolio? Yeah, so we have a small position in the local inflation-linked bonds, um, Eugene. Uh, that's a pure hedge for, for if we get inflation wrong. So, I mean, obviously, we bet that against the break, even what the market says the inflation is going to be. So I take the 2025, the market says inflation is going to be about just over 4%. So if we buy the, the, the inflation-linked bonds, we, we basically say, no, that they're wrong in a sense. Um, so that's where we are locally. Offshore, do we buy inflation-linked bonds? Um, no, because we don't think the yield plus the currency edge that we get can be in a, a, a substitute for the yields you get here on the local government bonds, to answer your question. And that actually answers my next question as well. So if you were to buy foreign bonds, be it ILBs or tips or credit, you would hedge out the currency. Exactly. Um, Eugene, I mean, you can't you can't take currency exposure in a in a in a well you probably can, but exactly. we don't want to give currency exposure Currency's to our clients because I mean especially when it comes to fixed income and you're trying to substitute the type of money market where we aim for for Steffi plus one and a half, for Steffi plus two, you don't want to create a lot of volatility through the currency because everyone on this call knows the currency one day it's 18. It's eight in the next day, it's 17. And if you have a five to a 10% exposure offshore or 20% exposure offshore, you're going to take a whole lot of volatility at drawdowns at the end of the day before you get your end result. And, and, and we think we can just, the, currently, um, the four points are the differential on the four points of the aging is quite big enough for us to, to be honest, a, a, a good enough offer for us to age. It makes a lot of sense. So uh, keeping that all that risks in mind as well. Maybe last question from my side, Mel, to you. Uh, the pond that you're fishing, I mean, you briefly touched on China's reopening as well, and we're hearing a lot of talk on China reopening. Uh, does that mean that your eye is shifting towards uh, emerging markets that might benefit from China's reopening and potentially venturing into China itself as well? Yes, from our side, we would never pick one specific geographic region. 
Um, we like to see China grow. We like the growth out of China, but we prefer to buy multinational companies um, that we feel a lot more reliable in terms of their reporting. And those companies can take advantage of that uh, growth. So we like to see China grow. And, um, you know, we have got an exposure to BHP in the worldwide flex, but if some of these uh, larger companies become palatable, palatable to us and we see good value there, we might add that to the portfolio. But in essence, we prefer to buy multinationals than to specifically go and buy a company in China because we don't speak Chinese and we prefer to buy companies that we understand. I do like that indeed. Gentlemen, we're unfortunately out of time. Uh, and maybe just to conclude quickly, Mel, you've got a very successful long track record on your worldwide flexible fund. It's been going forever and a day. And if you showed, you can you know how to manage that onshore offshore argument, taking all that misery away from uh, people like myself having to make this kind of calls. Uh, Andre, your portfolio may be not that old; it's fairly new. Uh, but if I look at your track record since inception, since you launched. Uh, you obviously know what you're doing as well, so exceptional returns here. So to both of you, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, uh, Thanks if you're still there for the introduction of Heidi Capital. We really appreciate it. To our thank audience you. out there, thank you for your continued support. Keep in mind, next week, Wednesday, the 5th of April, we will be talking about global and local property. Hoping to see you there into the VCI team for making this all possible. Tanya, all of our special thanks. And we'll see you again next week, Wednesday, to Mel, Andre, uh, and thanks, thank you so much. We'll chat to you again in the very near future. Thanks, indeed. Thanks, everyone.